Robbie, we're all dying to know what is on your radar. All right, Jessica. Well, remember when the federal government accused social media companies of spreading misinformation about COVID-19? Well, according to a recent bombshell report from Reuters, top U.S. policymakers should have pointed their fingers into a giant mirror. That's because the U.S. military, under both Presidents Donald Trump and Joe Biden, deliberately spread misinformation on social media about the COVID-19 vaccines in hopes of encouraging Filipinos to distrust the Chinese government. Now, the disinformation campaign, which involved hundreds of fake accounts on X, formerly known as Twitter, promoted the idea that Sinovac, the COVID-19 vaccine created in China, was dangerous. Quote, COVID came from China and the vaccine also came from China. Don't trust China, read one typical tweet. Other tweets aimed at Asian Muslims incorrectly asserted that the vaccines contained pork and were contrary to religious dictates. Now, one implied that the Chinese vaccine contained rat poison. What if their vaccines are dangerous, wondered another Twitter user, who in actuality was the U.S. military. Hmm. As my colleague at Reason Magazine, Matthew Petty, pointed out, poorly conceived government-backed disinformation campaigns supposedly aimed at foreign adversaries are actually nothing new. But this one is especially hypocritical, since opposition to vaccine misinformation has become one of the Biden administration's central philosophies. In January of 2021, Biden was sworn in as president of the U.S. with a mandate to return the country to normalcy amidst the death and destruction of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, by this time, the vaccines had become available to at-risk populations, and over the ensuing weeks and months, millions of Americans chose to become vaccinated. But the Biden administration became unsatisfied with the pace of vaccination. Government health advisors were particularly distraught about vaccine-hesitant Americans receiving bad information about COVID-19 from social media. In July, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy released an advisory describing misinformation as an urgent crisis. Quote, in recent years, the rapidly changing information environment has made it easier for misinformation to spread at unprecedented speed and scale, especially on social media and online retail sites as well as via search engines. That's what Murthy wrote. Misinformation tends to spread, he says, quickly on these platforms for several reasons. Now, indeed, the traditional media soon became obsessed with the idea that people were insufficiently enthusiastic about vaccination and that social media was to blame. It's all Facebook's fault. Familiar tale. The Center for Countering Digital Hate, British nonprofit group, branded 12 vaccine-skeptical online accounts as the disinformation dozen. Now, in its write-up about the disinformation dozen, the New York Times lamented that one of the offenders, a Florida doctor named Joseph Mercola, had made, quote, easily disprovable claims on Facebook. Mercola, quote, declared coronavirus vaccines were a medical fraud and said the injections did not prevent infections, provide immunity, or stop transmission of the disease. That was how the New York Times complained about the things he had to say as misinformation. Now, one sees the problem with stigmatizing any and all vaccine-related opinions that depart from the current accepted orthodoxy. While some of these claims do in fact seem easily disprovable in the summer of 2021, scientific consensus subsequently has conceded that the vaccines do not prevent infection. They do not provide permanent immunity. They do not stop transmission. The vaccines lower the risk of serious illness and death, particularly for vulnerable people, the elderly, the obese, and the chronically sick. But the miraculous powers initially attributed to them by government health advisors, coronavirus advisor Anthony Fauci describing vaccinated Americans as dead ends for COVID-19, well, that has not withstood the test of time, unfortunately. I wish it was otherwise, but it's not. Now, this is not to say that every crazy claim ever made about COVID-19 vaccines has been validated. Some social media users wrongly stated, for instance, that the vaccines caused a spike in deaths from heart conditions, even though researchers have found no evidence of this. Yet it remains the case that so many formerly controversial opinions relating to COVID-19 are no longer considered controversial at all. From the efficacy of cloth masks and social distancing, which Fauci now admits he essentially made up, to the possible laboratory origins of the disease. Public commentators who invade against misinformation ought to have been more circumspect. Nevertheless, Biden himself joined the chorus of government officials railing against misinformation on social media. He accused Facebook, 
and other platforms of, quote, killing people because they failed to police misinfo. Now, this wasn't mere criticism. A top White House communications director said the government was reviewing options to force the social media companies to take stronger actions, possibly by revoking their protection from some liability under Section 230, the federal law that makes the Internet possible. Emails between social media moderators and federal bureaucrats suggest that the companies took these threats very seriously. My March 2023 cover story, For Reason, argued that Facebook essentially outsourced coronavirus-related moderation to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, it's true that the federal government shut down the military disinformation campaign to discredit Sinovac within the first several months of Biden's presidency. But given how stridently the Biden administration sought to shift the onus of responsibility for vaccine hesitancy to social media companies, I think it's really galling that their own hands were not exactly squeaky clean. When he learned of the U.S. military's actions, Daniel Lucy, an infectious disease specialist at Dartmouth's Geisel School of Medicine, told Reuters, I'm extremely dismayed, disappointed, and disillusioned to hear that the U.S. government would do that. It is indeed very dismaying. So we've talked about this on the show already, but I I thought it was worth hammering home how wildly hypocritical it was for the government to be doing this and then whip itself up into a frenzy about misinformation on social media being the reason people are vaccine hesitant. They wanted Filipino people, Muslim people in Asia to be vaccine hesitant, even if it was going to get them killed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Fascinating that we're hearing about this now. Usually we have to wait like 20 years to hear about clandestine operations. But this is really good reporting. They talked to more than two dozen current and former U.S. military officials, military contractors, and social media analysts to look at those X tweets that were coming out. And so that's fascinating that we aren't supposed to know about this right now. They're probably in a frenzy because this is hitting the press. So this is a really good investigation. We need the press to be investigating things like this. So in, in times of journalism in the United States being just basically propaganda, not critical of the U.S. government, this is huge. This yeah. is like a really good story. And the other aspect of this is obviously it, it calls to mind the whole Russian influence um, uh, narrative yeah. where, so, so you know, I don't want to like overstate the influence of this, you know, this is like a couple hundred um, Twitter accounts, I think. Like, you know, who knows how many people actually saw them. But, you know, the, the media, the government, the Democrats went ballistic when they learned that Russian agents had mm-hmm. paid for a small number of, um, you know, anti-Hillary Clinton accounts on social media. Do I think this was, this make the election, like, illegitimate? Do I think it was particularly influ- influential? Absolutely not. But our media went crazy when they learned about that. And now we, like, we were doing it. We were doing that exact same thing. Uh, I guess we, no one cares that it's not election interference. It's like health interference. I, it's, it's crazy to me. I'm so glad you brought that up. This is one of the biggest things that I think of when I think of the hypocrisy around how the U.S. operates abroad versus at home. We were, not we, but like the, the liberals, the establishment Democrats yeah. were not we. so <laughs> upset. Not me and you, Robbie, yeah. <laughs> because both of our brains went directly to this. Yeah. In 2016, I, I went and pulled up my notes on this. Uh, the United States official governmental agency, the National Endowment for Democracy, in the year 2016, when we were very upset about what Russia was doing, this isn't like many years ago, they disclosed where their money was going. What mm-hmm. kinds of things were they supporting to promote democracy abroad? It turns out they gave $6.8 million to organizations across Russia for engaging activists and fostering Mm. civic engagement. And this was openly displayed on on the National Endowment for Democracy's website. Now you have to use the Wayback Machine, but the link is still there and it's been widely reported by, you know, some good people at the New York Times. Um, But the endowment no longer names Russian recipients. So the exact people who receive money to do activism and push democracy. It's really pushing a political narrative in a foreign country, precisely what we were upset about. But Navalny was named as one of the recipients. And so when he died and we were like, he was this hero, we can compare him to Nelson Mandela, when there are videos of him calling Muslim people cockroaches and he's been accused of being a white supremacist and that's what he was jailed for in the country, 
we can't really trust what the government says about what's going mm. on abroad and their operations in other countries to yeah. push you know, their influence, not democracy, not good public health or anything of the nature. Yeah, I don't trust the Russian government, I don't trust the Chinese government, but I don't trust our government. Mm -hmm. And so many of the things we accuse foreign, uh, you know, I'm not trying to create an equivalency, there are obviously more authoritarian governments than ours, you know, people are uh, uh, denied, you know, Political rights and free speech rights in in those countries, but you know, for all the all, all the claims we make, and then it looks like, oh, what is our own military doing? And what do we what do we see? And yeah, that's a great example of yeah, promoting democracy in a foreign country, right? When they're they're doing it to us, it's election interference. When we're doing it, it's just you know, I guess we get to do whatever we want. And you know, at the end of the day, it's like. My bottom line as a libertarian is, do taxpayers think this is a good use of their money? Do they want their money spent for, right, uh, uh, having an effect on elections in Russia? Do they want their money spent convincing uh, uh, the Uyghurs not to get vaccinated? Like, obviously not. People, no, <laughs> the vast majority of people want their money either not spent by the government or spent, like, repairing the roads and bridges in this country. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great, like, they, they want to... The U.S. government doesn't want to admit what it's doing with the money because they know it's not popular. And it makes them look bad and hypocritical. Yeah, absolutely. More rising right after this.